Hey guys, welcome to the fall panel series. I'm Christina. I'm an associate member of the Guild and I serve on the Education Committee. So if you're into this panel series, please consider joining the Guild. It's fun. It's a great experience. You can advance the profile of music supervisors and support the wonderful work they do. You also get monthly newsletters, event invites, various discounts. I think Angela is going to go ahead and put a link into the chat so you can get more info on how to join. It doesn't matter if you're not a music supervisor, if you're a label, if you're a library, if you're a musician, you can join under one of our various tiered member options. This panel series is produced by the Education Committee, and I want to thank everyone who worked so hard on this panel, and especially Viacom CBS for sponsorship. Um, Anita Chinkas Ratner is SVP Creative Music and Licensing Strategy at Viacom CBS, and she is going to be saying a few words and introducing today's moderator. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for the intro. Um, Viacom CBS is such a proud sponsor of the Guild of Music Supervisors. We're really happy to be doing a panel on the genre of musical variety and award shows. Um, it's a genre that we have a lot of over here at Viacom CBS, so we're pretty um, happy to be talking about it. Um, Connie Howell is going to be our moderator tonight, and she is the VP of Creative Music and Licensing Strategy. And she focuses on brands like CMT, BET, MTV, VH1, Logo, and Pop. Um, and I don't see her. Oh, there she is. I'll turn it over to you, Khan. Thanks, Anita. And thank you to the Guild for having me. I'm really excited about this panel today. And you know, this topic of music supervision and live performance variety shows, as Anita mentioned, you know, we're pretty well versed in that over at Viacom CBS. We have several of these types of shows. And, and one thing I think about with this genre is that it's so different from scripted reality or documentaries in that these types of shows have high volumes of, of songs that, that are used. There's last minute changes and, and, and there's a lot more interaction sometimes with the artists and the artist reps. And the people that we've assembled today for this panel are experts in this world. So it's really exciting. And they've been working on some of our favorite award shows and musical competition shows. And I think all together they have about 40 plus years of experience. So we're in for a treat today. And, and the, not to mention the fact that there's several uh, GMS winners in this, in this group as well. So I wanna intro our amazing panel. We have Angela Jo Levet, who's worked on An Sunday Best. We have Robin Kay, who's worked on American Idol and the NAACP Image Awards. We have Rick Krimble, who's worked on MTV VMAs, uh, movie, movie and TV Awards and the Disney Sing Along. And we have Jill Myers, who's worked on Songland, Lip Sync Battle and The Voice, and that's just to name a few. Um, so thank you guys for being here with us tonight. We're really excited. And I think I wanna start with a bit of an icebreaker. So I would love for you guys to kind of go around and kind of share with us how you got your start and what were some of your first projects. We'll start with Rick. Jumping right in, all right. Um, <laughs> um, well, I went to school actually for film and television, so not even music related. Um, and it wasn't until I moved out here that I uh, got a job at MTV at Viacom. <laughs> um, and I music coordinated for a little while. I actually remember going into the interview and saying like, I don't know how to do this job, but it sounds really cool. <laughs> and so music coordinating there taught me kind of everything that I knew and then jumped freelance and uh, took on a couple of their shows, but I've stayed true to working on VMAs and the movie and TV awards because those are just an original love for me, even as a child growing up. They're that pop culture moment every year. So I enjoy being a part of them. Awesome. That's key. What about you, Jill? Um, I started out many moons ago as the uh, scoring coordinator at Columbia Pictures, which is a job I started crying about because I didn't want to have a real job back then because I just wanted to be a hippie and be free. But anyway, it kind of was a, was a career for me to start out with. But I leaped into this part of the world in mm -hmm. a show called Rockstar in Excess in 2005. I got hired by Mark Burnett's company to work on that show. And I kind of flipped to TV after doing a lot of features for so many years. And I've done several variety shows since. Awesome. Angela? Uh, started out as a DJ, so many years ago, and um, ended up working with the Recording Academy in the awards department, overseeing gospel music TV and film, 
in world music. So I did that for a decade. And I actually worked on the pre-show quite a bit, booking talent uh, for the pre-show for the Grammys. So naturally progression for me, overseeing TV and film, I wanted to get on the other side of the coin. And here I am uh, four years later, so. Awesome. You kind of glossed over the DJ part. I, I do want to mention that I have heard that you are actually one of the top DJs in LA. So wow. let's just... I'm in my DJ room. <laughs> Make that clear. Um, and Robin, what about you? Uh, well, I started um, working for Waylon Jennings in Nashville and then segued to a record company in Nashville, went to Chicago in man artist management then I uh, came out to LA and I kind of had coveted getting into this end of the business, but I knew, you know, it was, it was hard to get into then. Someone, I actually met with some friends and they said, I said, how do I get in that end of it? And they said, someone has to die. Nobody ever quits these jobs. And I got a, so I took another job at a publishing company for a little while. And then I got a call from someone that someone had passed away and there was an opening at MCA. And that's where I started and then I ended up at Polygram. Uh, records and then uh, segued into accidentally got into supervision with the singing bee, which was kind of getting thrown into the deep end of it all. And then uh, that's how I got into this. Awesome. Well, like I said, I really appreciate your, your guys' time today, and we're really excited to have all of you. So let's get to it. Um, first question is How is music selected for these types of shows? And how much input on song selection comes from talent or showrunners versus you guys as the music supervisors? I'll go to Rick first. <laughs> For her. Um, I mean, with award shows, um, obviously a lot of it is dictated by what's nominated. <laughs> um, so that's, that's what happens with all of the nomination packages and all of that. Performances, um, we just try to highlight whoever is is you know, coming out with something new. We always try to be fresh. The cool part of being a part of these shows is they happen every year. And so you kind of have this timeline uh, that you try to work within. I try to not play something that's, you know, I could have used last year. Um, so um, I, I pitch all of the songs for our presenter walk-ons and any other moments that are a part of the show, credits and the open and things like that. Um, and then a lot of the time, um, whatever network or thing I'm working with MTV with the VMAs, um, they are involved with selecting who's going to perform. And it's usually whatever their brand new single is, or the, my favorite part doing the video Vanguard performances, because you get to highlight the entire career of an artist, which is so cool. Um, and that's about it. That's how we, we, I present it to the producers and then we go through the whole show and we try to um, tailor each song to whoever we're seeing. So if someone's walking out, you try to do something that feels like them and makes mm -hmm. sense for, for the moment. Okay. And in the competition world, what about you guys? Want to go first, Robin? You want me to go first? Go ahead. <laughs> um, and it really depends on what the show is. Um, something like The Voice, we draw a lot from what the contestants have a list of songs that they like to sing because obviously you would never want to have somebody sing something that they don't feel comfortable doing because they're they're not going to perform as well but on that particular show the coaches have an incredible amount of input into what the songs are they do a lot of the picking and of course the network always has to approve i don't know about viacom but major networks are very big on approving songs and notes um something like lip sync battle of course you would never make a celebrity to a song that they didn't know, so we really want to uh, cater to them. So we present them with a lot of pre-cleared recordings, but then we would always end up clearing something at the last minute. And Songland, for instance, does not have pre-existing songs. It's all new. It's all new songs. So that's uh, it's, that's a whole different uh, animal. Songland, because it's not a competition show in the typical competition sense. Uh, okay, I'll jump in. So for Idol, it's it's uh, the contestants almost always pick their own music. It's kind of part of the competition, the actual their song selection and what they would what they would pick. So we do our best to get them what they want and what they think is going to make them look the best and sing the best. Um, we pick a lot of the background songs, obviously, 
Um, but other than except for maybe a couple of episodes where the judges might pick for one episode, the rest of it's all up to the contestants. Okay. And going back to Lip Sync Battle for, for a second, Jill, the, what comes first, the music or the casting? Um, yes, both. It's like what comes, um, we, we always pre-clear a lot of recordings with the hopes that they'll pick those recordings. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the casting happens at the very last minute on a show like that. So frequently on Friday night, and Robin did one season of this, she will vouch for it, but frequently on a Friday night for a Sunday taping, you're getting, we just hired Connie, Connie Howell is going to be a celebrity and she wants to do like a U2 song or something. And then you're like frantically trying to get something cleared for the, the celebrity because they particularly don't want to look foolish. They definitely want to be performing something they feel like they can really show off their artistry. Mm -hmm. so that's a very hard show, Lip Sync Battle. Especially she didn't mention that would get the songs or we would get the song on maybe a Friday night or a Saturday morning yeah. and they would need it for Saturday day or Sunday. Mm -hmm. So we would have to go to people on the weekends and that's, that's where the relationships come in, you know, where you really you have to bother people on their weekend and ask them to clear a song for you. It's tough. And, and we would, and always at the beginning of the season, we would tell that casting and the producers do not even let anybody consider doing a Beatles recording or a certain recordings that we, or ACDC. And half the time you get a request for Michael Jackson or the Beatles or something like that anyway. Yeah, they so were, that's, we, they had a Spice Girls, uh, someone wanted the Spice Girls on a Saturday. And for the Spice Girls, they're almost impossible to clear normally anyway, but then you also have four management people to go to you, in, all over the world. So things like that. So. Uh, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> That's a tough one. It's a real, it's, it is very yeah. tough. So that actually brings up what I was going to ask you next is uh, how do you manage those expectations of talent or showrunners when they have these tight budgets, but want these major songs that are so hard to get? Drink a lot of wine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, but it's, it's uh, how do you manage them? It, it really depends. It's, um, the people who hire us for the most part of production teams and are not necessarily the showrunner. So they will have our backs for the most part because they're our clients. And mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to tell them, you tell the showrunner, people say no and they do say no and you just have to live with it. You know, it's not the end of the world, but there are certain showrunners that are uh, difficult. Right, Robin? We both dealt with one of them. I mean, that are just like almost abusive. So um, most of them understand, I mean, they get it. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, there you go. <laughs> no. um, so, Angela, let's yep. talk a bit about Sunday Best. So that show came back after a two-year hiatus. and it a five-year hiatus. Oh, five, five years. Five years. Yeah, five I didn't years. realize it was that long either, so. Time travels so quickly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it was gone for quite a bit, and then it came back with... Um, guys brought some fresh ideas. So Sunday, yeah, so talk to us about it. Tell us, uh, explain to people what the premise of the show is for those who aren't familiar and, and give us a little bit about what ideas you guys brought back after five years. Yeah, so Sunday's Best is obviously the American idol of gospel music. So this is finding the biggest star in gospel that's to come. And so this was really a passion project for me to work on this show after working at the Academy in gospel for so long. Um, but in this particular scene, in this episode, this was episode nine, so there were three finalists left, and they were tasked with performing an original song um, that they had never performed or even heard before. And it was called Who I Am is that episode. And so I basically brought in a seven-time Grammy-winning producer, a hit-making songwriter, to put these three original songs together in the studio for those three finalists. Tiffany uh, got inside her head a little bit. So this is a little bit of a the war story for me, but you know, talent, they obviously in a competition like this have to trust the creators and the people around them to obviously be able to guide them and build them to this final you know, place they're trying to be, which is the winner of this competition. And if you heard some of the judges, they were saying, we didn't even know that you were uncomfortable singing this song. We didn't know that you didn't like this song. And she kind of like got in her own head at that point. And she was eliminated that episode because of that, because she really didn't just, you know, embody, you know, what that song really meant for her to show, like, I'm capable of doing this. This is, 
why I'm here. No matter what you throw at me, no matter what you give me, I'm going to smash and I'm going to kill it. That wasn't her best performance. You know, mm -hmm. you may hear her singing and she's projecting and she's singing the song, but she did not really embody what that song really represented and what we wrote for her. And the song was called You Got Favor. And she did not really express that when performing that song. So I really wanted to pick that because that was the one episode where we created original music for the show and they weren't singing traditional gospel or songs that existed. And this was their chance to shine. And she kind of got in her own way with that episode. So I worked with the contestants from beginning to end, picking their audition songs after watching their audition tapes in different markets and pretty much held their hand throughout the whole entire season. And so I was very close to the contestants. Um, I created playlists ahead of time before we ever got to set with the producers of the show, Jesse Collins and, you know, Aaron or Mr. Blackstone, our MB. So we can actually tailor these songs for their vocals, for who they are as artists, so they could put their best forth effort. So that was really important to me to work with them in that capacity where I, you know, took into consideration their strengths and weaknesses and placed them with songs that would allow them to shine. So. That's an amazing story. Um, you brought up to the, the original music in that episode. So, you know, the process for those songs different from, you know, all other songs, popular songs in terms of licensing, like those original songs, are you getting those for gratis or are you paying the same fees for the other songs in the show? The songwriter and producer felt like it was given for gratis. You know, um, like I told you, I went to some pretty big name gospel producers and songwriters that honestly kind of worked with me because of our relationship. And, you know, they were passionate about working on Sunday's Best and seeing it come back after the five year uh, period. So, you know, they don't have any ownership over the song. If we wanted to give this song to Fantasia, you know, we couldn't really do that because of the type of deal that's done with the network. So, right. And so I think another one of the, the interesting twists that you guys brought to the show was the rewriting of secular songs. So I think in that season, there was like, uh, you rewrote Hers, Focus, and you did, uh, uh, so we did quite a few rewrites and anyone in licensing knows trying to get, you know, lyric changes is not the easiest thing to do. But I think in your case, it might have been more beneficial that you were changing songs to make them, you know, inspirational. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. can you talk a bit about how you partnered with the songwriters and the house band on those? Yeah, I actually hired um, Akiba Riddick Woods, and we worked together uh, for the hit song Won't He Do It when we worked on Greenleaf together. So her background is J-Lo, Beyonce. She's a mainstream writer mostly, and I worked with her with Corinne Harthon for Won't He Do It, and basically we got a, a number one hit in gospel for her with that for Greenleaf. So I wanted to bring her back in the fold. She is passionate about working in gospel, and you know she pretty much wrote all the songs for that episode. It was called the Remix episode, which is episode three. So we took Can You Stand the Rain, New Edition. We took SZA, Her, you know, Brandy, you name it. And we made them into inspirational songs. And, you know, that was one of my favorite episodes as well to work on because I'm really passionate about growing the gospel genre and not staying in a box and continuing to evolve the sound. And traditionally, Sunday's Best is a traditional gospel show. So we pushed the envelope a little bit, you know, Jesse Collins and his team, they they wanted to see that happen. And I think we did a great job doing that as well as, you know, the Aretha Franklin episode we did and, you know, best iconic moments in black gospel television scenes. So we had a lot of fun on this season and I think it was one of the best. I'm not just saying that because I worked on it, but, you know, they never had a music supervisor before me in the whole nine years that the show exists. So I was the first music supervisor to ever come on board for Sunday's Day. So I'm very honored to be a part of that, continuing that legacy. Yeah. And we, we thank you for your great work on that show. I know personally that the audience is very happy that gospel and, and you did an amazing job. Thank you. Um, Appreciate it. So kind of continuing with that original music uh, line, Jill, let's talk about Songland. Songland is that's a great show. I, I love it. It's a lot of passion for it. Songland, for those of you who have not seen it, is a show where we bring in unknown songwriters and they um, compete to be uh, have a song covered by a well-known artist. So there's three producers, Ryan Tedder, Shane McNally, and Esther Dean. Um, and 
if the guest artist every week selects a, a writer, selects three writers and they work with the three producers and they the songs morph. So what you saw was Madeline Merlot bringing a song in called I Drink to That. And then you saw a little bit of the critique between the producers and the um, the guest artists was Lady Antebellum or Lady A, sorry. And um, you could see how they start working on the song right there and the genius of these producers and these artists. It was like so amazing to watch this just for so many episodes, like how they would spontaneously come up with ideas. And then if you got paired with a producer, you would spend a week with that producer, which is an amazing opportunity for a songwriter. And this is like a dream for them. And then the guest artist picks one to, to cover. So you saw at the end of that song now became Champagne Nights, which was a suggestion during the postmortem of the performance. And, that, and I think we picked that, those clips because that's the one song that became the biggest hit out of the show for Lady A. So it's really, it's a, it's a great opportunity for songwriters. They, um, a lot of them have signed deals with producers like Sam DeRose, who was on the first episode, signed with Shane. And a lot of them have just really formed um, bonds with each other. Like the, I forgot the name of it, Connie, because you pointed out to me, but the NBC promo with all of the people, they wrote a song together. Hands up. Hands up, Yeah. So, uh, it's it's uh it's it's an unusual show because you're basically singing song in songs that don't exist yet because you start with a song and it's like any song that you bring to a producer a lot of people start working on it so first the producers work on it and they they change the song so they get a piece of the song and the guest artists work on it and, and if they pick it then it gets up to be a commercial recording and then a lot more producers come in so by the time the song's done, you have 12 or 14 writers. You're basically making deals after the show's there. So that's something that's really interesting because the song starts one way, like you say, and then becomes something completely right. different. So you're in this process of hearing different iterations of the same song, or technically it's a different song by the end. So how does that complicate things in your process? Well... It's only com it, it doesn't really it just complicates because you have to make deals. Some of the pub some of the writers are not published, and some of them are published. So you're constantly running around trying to make deals. A lot of them are having to make deals with the lawyers, I and mean, you really have to know the publishing side of business to work on a, a show like that that deals with songwriters. And some of the songs completely morph, like the song John Legend did in season one. You wouldn't recognize the song from what the girl originally sang by the time they worked through it. So some of them sound quite a lot like they did originally, and some of them sound like totally different. But it's really a lot of fun. And it's a, such a great show for songwriters because what kind of opportunities do they get to, to showcase themselves? So would you say that working on a songwriting show is different from working on a singing competition show? A hundred percent different. You're not, some of them don't even sing. Some of the songwriters don't sing. They have to bring in people to sing for them. And it's, it's a whole different, it's like writers and actors. Awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. So Robin, you are the American Idol queen. So I think at this point, everyone knows what the premise of American Idol is. So we, 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 we won't go there, but just like that show, many of your other shows have a large volume of clearances. Do you handle those clearances yourself or do you work with the clearance team with the network or outside? What's your process? Yeah, it obviously depends on the show. And I used to do each show, I would bring in a team if I needed it. Um, on Idol, I have a whole team. I have a whole staff of four that are, you know, amazing people and and uh, they get the job done. And they work hard. Um, yeah, it's it's a challenging show because, like, working on four different shows, we're probably the only show that's on all year that we work on all year. Um, you know, usually you're on a show until the season's over, and then hopefully it comes back the next year. But we work literally the whole year. So in the, in the in the summer, we're clearing bonds for the upcoming season. We're licensing from the previous season. So it's kind of you know the calm time where we can get all the paperwork done. And then in the fall, we get heavy into post and, and supporting the auditions. And then in uh, the winter, we're starting to do production and we're pre-tape shows and we're still working heavy on post and trying to find a lot of background songs. And um, and then we, in the spring, we get into the live shows where we're working very closely with the contestants and helping them navigate this crazy thing they're going through and 
helping them find the songs that are going to showcase the best. And sometimes we have to um, you know, give them a quick tutorial on things. We did a, a couple of years ago, we did a Prince. Um, a lot, you'd be shocked, but a lot of the kids didn't know their which I was shocked at. Um, so we had to kind of help them find which one would be, which song would be good for them. And, and um, but yeah, as far as the clear, back to the clearance, um, it depends on how big the volume is and build a team. The most important thing is to have as much lead time as you can get on these shows. So when it's high volume, you know, you can work late, you can, you can work through the weekends, but you have to be cognizant of the people that you're going to for the clearances. So, you know, they can't take on a huge bulk. They have a lot of other stuff they're working on. So you have to, the lead time is very helpful. So you want to get, you know, you don't want to inundate them with everything because you may not be able to get, you know, your the volume that you need taken care of if, if you, you know, throw it all at them at once. Right. So you and I were talking and you, you told me about this interesting thing that you do, which I'm going to steal. <laughs> it's how you clear uh, sh these songs for these shows for life of show versus per episode or per season. Can you share with uh, the rest of the group here about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I started on Idol and I, the first season, I saw the insanity of it and you know, all, and the volume that I, and I, you know, and I was going to the publishers for a lot of songs that we would need and we would clear and then we may not use them. You know, we would use a lot of songs. We probably use more than any other show or at least comparable, but, um, but, you know, I thought, and having had been on the other side of it, you know, I understand what they have to go through when they have to, even if it's, you know, like Motown songs, you know, you have to log it every single year. You have to log every single song. In. Uh oh, Robin has a problem with freezing. Uh -oh. Ask them if they're with Idol, and some of them are. Yeah. Like, this happens. So, you, um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so, how do you stop? You know, how do you help that volume? How do you help the people that you're going to? So we clear for a life of show now. So when you go to your writer, you can say, do you want to have your songs in Idol, in American Idol, in The Voice, those kind of things? And if they say absolutely yes, then it's clear for the life of the show. And you don't have to go back every single year. What I do at the end of the season is I, I send them back your list, like I would give Sony, here's all the songs you keep here. For. They would have the opportunity to go through it, see if they lost any copyrights, uh, see if, they, if any artist has had a writer has had a part, um, and remove it. So it's not really life of show, but it's you know, technically life of show. And then we do that over the summer, and then we start out with this huge bank of songs every season, and every season it gets bigger and bigger. So it saves publishers a tremendous amount of time even though labels love it mm -hmm. and it's the same it's the same concept by the way of um licensing at the end of the season like licensing on a per season basis mm -hmm. some publishers can't do it some of the ones that are more admin but the bigger publishers love it too because you do you know one per you know some of us have 30 episodes you know per season so you know, one license as opposed to 30. Mm -hmm. so. And are they ask? and I'm asking for purely selfish reasons here, are they agreeing to these uh, approvals for life of show uh, for multiple uses? Or is it just like, if you use the song in season five, can you then again use the song in season seven under that same clearance? Or do you have to go back to them because you've already used it? No, it's the same exact thing. I mean, you know, for something like Idol, and because of, you know, working with these people for so long, if it's a, you know, they know when they're approving it, they're approving the overall uses for Idol, whether it's a background use or whether it's a performance. And sometimes they'll say, we just want a performance. We don't want any background uses on this or, or, or vice versa. You know, however they want it is, is how we would use it. Um, but usually it's just, 
you know, whatever, because they know this show. And if something comes up and it's kind of, it's going to be a weird use, they know I'm going to call them. They know I'm not going to, you know, do something that's might make them unhappy with it. So um, it's really, it hasn't come up. I don't think we've had one circumstance where anyone was not happy with any of the pieces. Awesome. Yeah. Like I said, I'm going to steal that. And mm-hmm. so will my entire team. <laughs> and, you know, the more that I've always talked to people about doing this because it's not my little secret. I want everyone to use it because the more that the publishers are freed up by, the, you know, by these, this process, the more we are all able to get our clearances done quicker. So it's kind of, it's good for everybody. Yeah, it's really true. Um, so let's pivot a bit and let's talk about our award shows. So Rick, the VMAs this year were amazing. Uh, so congrats on a great show. And I think that it has a distinction to the second most social show this year, just behind the Super Bowl. So shame was plugged for Viacom. Um, <laughs> so with our with award shows, we, we consider the holy grail uh, being able to get these big name performers. Uh, do you participate in choosing any of the artists and the songs they perform, or is your role primarily with the focus on source music? Um, it depends. Um, a lot of the times we start out the show early on, and I'll put together just a list of, you know, what's coming up. But um, there's also a full talent team that's a, a part of Icon that that handle a lot of these bookings. So I'm um, like maybe. 20% involved in, in the performance world. Um, but then putting together performances, what I think is fun and, and being a part of, you know, doing a different kind of version of their song. If it's a song that's been out for a little bit or premiering a brand new song, those are the, the parts that I, I sink my fingers into then. <laughs> yeah. And then the, the show was originally slated for the Barclays Center and there was hope that it could still happen, but you know, for COVID reasons, obviously the 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 black cloud over most of our lives now. Uh, it took place at various locations across the city. Uh, can you talk about how the show was executed and how your role was impacted with the new COVID gui- guidelines? Yeah, this this year was an interesting one. <laughs> uh, when I started out, I was booking a flight to go to Brooklyn, <laughs> and uh, we we held true to that for as long as we possibly could, and trying to figure out new ways to do audiences. We were like the first big award show in this new world, um, so trying to figure out how to do that was a a, a big undertaking. Um, and I can take no credit for any of that. Um, <laughs> but how it affected me would be usually, I mean, part of what I love about these shows is the race to the finish line. Um, and this show, we kind of had to know things sooner um, because we, you know, did a couple of pre-tapes. We did a couple of separate locations that we would film throughout the night. So there, there was a lot more that had to be in place before our usual crazy show week. Um, so that changed a little bit for me, but creatively, um, I don't think so. It was, it was, we still got presenter walk-ons. They were a little shorter than I love them to be because there was no full stage, but, um, but we made one. And so I just think that's a pretty cool thing. And the reason I showed this clip is not, not particularly for the sync, but to me working on these shows is, is the like pop culture moment of it all. And so, like, I thought showing the credits was when we do our highlight reel to show everything that has happened in that show um, was kind of a cool way to show that off. Yeah, it was, it, like I said, it was a great show and it looked amazing. Um, but kind of keeping with that COVID thread, like the pandemic had a massive impact on productions, you know, everywhere. And this genre in particular, uh, can you guys talk a bit about how your shows changed? I know Robin in your American Idol clip I think you guys were the first uh, singing competition show that that came back in the middle of COVID and kind of set the tone how for some how some of the other ones followed suit um, followed suit after that. So can you talk about it? Yeah, we we were caught right in the middle of it. We had we were right in the middle of the season and we had just come back from taking forty of the contestants to Hawaii and we came back with twenty kids and we were you know just about to. Come on with the live shows or the pre- just pre- tape right before live, and when it hit, and we thought it was going to be a couple of weeks, so we were like, "Should we here? Should we send them home?" And 
So we, we isolated everybody for um, a couple of weeks and then we realized what was happening and that it wasn't going to be. And we didn't know if we were going to be able to continue the show. So we just finally, you know, it, everyone decided we, we have to make this happen. So um, it, we had to send everybody home. And it was it was amazing thing to watch because in real time we were watching everybody figure this out. And it was crazy. We had all these 20 kids at their different homes in different states. And we, we were sending them stuff, you know, stuff to you know, microphones and we used three uh, iPhones for each. Each one had three iPhones set up. We shot, shot a lot of it on iPhone. And you know, we were sending them decorations for their walls if they needed it. And, and eventually, you know, towards the end, we actually had to send to the, to the finalists, we had to send like sound trucks you know, where the sound could go through this place, I think it was in the you know, to get a real, real good feed. It was you know, live and you know, so important. And um, but every, every single episode was a nail biter because we didn't know what we were dealing with. We, we were making it up as we go, and the lighting and sound people and the way they figured it all out was just mind blowing to me. We went, we went immediately to Zoom. We were doing. Um, I had to set up all the um, vocal coaching. Had to go in you know, Zoom. So we had like three vocal coach rooms going uh, via Zoom at at you know all at the same time, and then um, you know just everything was done done via Zoom, and then somehow we pulled it off, and it was, it was an amazing, amazing thing to watch. Well, you guys definitely did a great job. I, I think <laughs> you guys pulled it off. It kind of showed us that Sunday Best could come back for season seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I can't take the credit for the amazing thing you pulled off either. Um, I think one of the best parts of, uh, or one of the, the, the most fun parts of being a music supervisor is discovering and breaking new artists. Um, but, you know, COVID restrictions, you know, we don't have shows like we used to, we don't network like we used to, so it's a whole new world. How are you guys staying connected to music and networking in this new world era? Angela, we'll start with you. A lot of Zooms, you know. <laughs> It's a, it's a Zoom world now, but you know, there's still obviously a lot of content in the world and there was before COVID. So I'm still connected to, you know, all the links of sound clouds and YouTubes and Instagrams. And I'm always looking for talent. You know, I'm always receiving messages from talent and wanting me to hear their new music. And, you know, it's just, I think we're more connected now than ever because you have to physically be in one place or another to connect with someone. And now I just think it's more of a, a web and we're all connected more than we know, you know, with this experience. So I think it's been positive on my end. And I think I've connected with even more people. So, awesome. Rick, I see you nodding. You agree with that? I, totally. I, th I think it's funny to me because, you know, you can go to one show, maybe two in a night if you're if you can handle that. Um, mm -hmm. But nowadays I can check in on three live streams of performing artists and it seems like artists have upped that game and are, are, are trying to, you know, make sure that they're getting out to their fans as well. And so there's just an endless amount of finding that can happen this way, <laughs> but any different than seeing it in person. I still love a live performance. There's nothing that will beat that, but yeah, I, I think, think it's, it's definitely it's, making up for it now. See, it was a very slow spring. <laughs> now. Very true. Very true. It's coming through. But uh, let's talk about Disney Family Sing Along. Uh, that was a huge production. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, tell us about it for the people who haven't seen it, and then let us know what your preparation was working on a project like that. Um, that's a show that has a little little big space in my heart. <laughs> um, the Disney Family Sing Along is a little special that we whipped together at the very beginning of COVID. Uh, we were cities were just closing down. People were just staying home for a bit. Um, and, uh, we just, the creative team wanted to lift people's spirits. Like we're, we're stuck at home, but we can still be together was our big mantra from the, from the beginning of that one. And, um, I got very involved with pitching songs with that. I'm a big Disney fan. I grew up with it. So all of those films and all of that music was, was, you know, dear to me. So 
that was super fun to be involved with what songs we should do, who should sing them, who could sing them, <laughs> um, and things like that. And then putting together the show was crazy. We did it in like, I think it was nine days of production and then two or three days of, of almost overnight edits. And then it aired that Sunday or something. Um, it was a crazy, crazy turnaround. And there's no way we could have done it without all of those artists who performed were the cinematographer, the audio person. They, this was the very beginning and no one was going into anyone's spaces. So we dropped off a sanitized kit at someone's home and they opened up the door, took it in. We helped them set it up through Zoom. A director sat on Zoom. I have a, an amazing MD who was also on the Zoom and we coached them through performing and all of that creative. Um, some of the artists ran with it and you know shot themselves in different ways. Some just sat on their couch with their dog and performed. And I just think it had a charm that, that we uh, can only capture in this weirdness of that circumstance. So but, you, did you match the talent with the songs that they performed? We did. We usually went to an artist with a song that we were looking for. A um, couple obviously were like, oh, but this is my favorite song. And we would work with them and, and, and figure out a song. But we always took songs to, to the talent that we were picking for both. We've done two versions now and we actually have coming up and at the uh, uh, end of this month is they're do, we're doing a Disney sing along holiday edition. Mm -hmm. So bringing some holiday songs to, to your home as a gift. <laughs> so I'll ask you offline what those Disney fees were. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it helps to be a part of the family. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the workflow on all of these shows is incredibly different. Uh, from a scripted or, or produced non-scripted reality show. Uh, what's a typical day like when you guys are in the throw, throes of production? We'll start with Jill. What's a typical day like while we're in, in production? Yeah. Um, which show? Um, on Songland, production day, just we spent, we taped everything in like two weeks and we spent like almost every day there all day. It was a very, very small stage. It was really, really intimate. Um, so... Most of these, when you're in, when they're taping or the live shows, or whatever, it's pretty much twelve hours a day. It's, and sometimes you don't have any hour, any hours a day, just but you're really 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 busy, and there's a lot of pressure to get things done because on these types of shows, as Rick said, there's so many deadlines because there's tape dates. You just you just have to get it done. So, but I do want to say something about what he said. It's pretty incredible the tech the technical crews um, during these Zoom times. It's just amazing what the entertainment industry has been able to do. I mean, it's like the entertainment industry is something that they, everybody should model themselves out, getting themselves back on the horse. Really, it's just been amazing. And staying true to guidelines. We'll, we'll we take yeah. our guidelines and yeah. do it yeah. properly, but we're gonna figure out how. We're gonna do it either way. <laughs> yeah. Angela, what, what about you? What's a typical day like for you? Uh, not a lot of sleep when I was shooting Sunday. <laughs> I was on set uh, Tyler Perry's for a month and pretty much we would shoot the actual performance days. And then we were in rehearsals with Kirk Franklin uh, the following day. And we were shooting those as well, creating packages around the actual uh, rehearsals. And I was once again, holding the hand of these contestants all along the way. So I was responsible for, you know, having these meetings with the EPs on the show and the MDs for all the music we had pre-selected prior to shooting. And we would go in the room after every end of day, we'd shoot either the rehearsal or the performance and have to decide what we were going to assign to those uh, contestants for the next episode. So I was responsible to get those songs to the contestants. And sometimes it'd be two o'clock in the morning, Atlanta time, and I'm LA girl, so I'm already off. And I'm basically, you know, not getting much sleep, making sure I'm emailing every individual, making sure they receive the email, that they have enough time to even rehearse the song before they get to rehearsals the next day. So it was really not a lot of time in between shoot days uh, for me to take a breath, but I enjoyed every moment of it, so. That's great. Um, Robin, do you think you guys face more challenges than your counterparts in the other genres? And if so, can you share what some of those are? Other soup music supervisors and yeah, like versus a scripted show or a, a standard reality show. 
I mean, I, I would say we have different um, volume wise and and maybe quantity. Of course, we're going to have a lot more of that. But I mean, sometimes it's easier or I don't think it's any harder. Let's say I, I'll put it this way. To me, it's just as hard to come up with one song for one scene that you have to get the producer and the director and everybody to like this one song for this one moment is no, um, it's, it's just as hard as it is for us to come up with a big list of songs to choose from. Or So I wouldn't say it's, it's easier. Um, we just have much bigger volume. Yeah, I mean, for clearance, you know, it's, it's way worse. It's way, way bigger. And um, I don't think they, most of the supervisors that do scripted would want to do it because they preferred, you know, the creative side. And then the clearance, they get it done. But for us, clearance is a much bigger part of it. And it's, you know, it's just as challenging for us because we have to, you know, we're, we're getting stuff for these kids. So it's not just, you know, a scene. We we have the this kid that's they're, they're they think their whole life is dependent on getting this one song, and that they that's the song they have to sing. So it's you know it's a little more personalized that way. So that part makes it more challenging. What do you think? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jill. No, I was just to say I work on a show called Beat to Sound, which is a the show that Jamie Fox hosts. It's a game show. We mm -hmm. cleared. We've done four seasons of clearing 2,000 to 2,500 songs and 2,000 to 2,500 masters in a six-week period. So <laughs> it's, not, it's pretty intense. Wow. So at the end of this, I think I can speak for everyone here who would like to know how do we get on to the show, Beat Shazam? I think you've got, you have some pretty good contestants in this room. So just tell us where to sign up for that. I don't know if it's going to get picked up again. We're distressed. So... Um, I think you just whenever on any of these shows, I think you just go to this the website or the, the station and you can it's all through casting. It's all casting. Well, we know you personally, so you know we have <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, do you guys think there are misconceptions that you battle when supervising a, a live variety show? Are you asking me? I'm asking you. That's a Rick question, right? <laughs> It's uh, <laughs> misconceptions. Um, uh, I think, I mean, just about the shows in general, people think it's so planned. They're live events. Anything can happen. Um, we, the, the part of my job that I like is the prep and the, the planning for all scenarios, but that, that's a lot of extra work sometimes for nothing <laughs> because, you know, we make contingency plans, we make contingency packages and things that have songs in them that might not air if, you know, the show goes as planned and things like that. So um, I guess the misconception would just be that what you see is all we did. And that's definitely not the case. Yeah. I think the misconception on my end is that maybe the contestants are picking their own songs at times to perform. And that only really happened in one of the episodes. Even in the auditions, uh, I gave the producers a list of public domain songs from the beginning for all the markets and the different uh, auditions. And they pretty much had a, a condensed list that they had to select from. So it's a lot of a guidance from my end on what they're going to sing on any given episode. So. Awesome. Uh, let's talk about some war stories. Let's hear the, let's hear the juice. And feel free to to change the names to protect the not so innocent. But you know, can you guys give us some some interesting battle stories uh, from your past or present? Um, I can. I don't know if it's a battle story, but war. Well, Robin and I both shared a person that uh, that Anita knows all about. That the entire the entire experience of this person was a war story. You'd get calls at 11 at night or seven in the morning. It's, it's, it's a very good idea to stay away from um, difficult showrunners because it, it's really intense and it puts you in a bad mood. But um, I had an interesting one on The Voice when Pharrell was a, was a coach where he uh, did something that we didn't have clear and he changed the lyric and they had denied it. And he didn't, nobody knew who was gonna do it. And I was, I sat on a phone with Pharrell Charming, this 
songwriter's wife for an hour until she was just, okay, Pharrell. It was after the fact. It was, that was, that's always the worst thing that can happen on a live show is when somebody does something that they're not supposed to do or that you were denied. And there you are. Uh, yeah. Yes, I was going to say Steven Tyler was famous for ad libbing stuff on the live shows. He would only do it on the live shows. And while the PJ he would just blurt out something or just start singing, getting it ready for him, just you know, typing lyrics because we sometimes they were limericks. You know, we were just clearing live. You know, he started singing. Uh, when we had a, con a contestant named Eugene. And so, you know, we had to pay for the Beatles song, you know, for, for two syllables you know, several times. Uh, but one of my one of my war stories is when we had uh, a, an opera group, trio, I think it was a trio that called Il Divo that came on the show, um, Universal put them on the show, and we didn't know what the song was until that day, and they told us it was um, O Solo Mio. And they told me it was PG, not to worry about it. And I was, and something in the back of my mind, I knew there was some problem with that song. I knew I'd heard some kind of story about it. And I looked into it and sure enough, it was not PD in Italy. Somehow it had come out of PD in Italy. So we finally, you know, really crazy with the time change and everything, we got a hold of the publishers. And, Italy, and they said no. They said absolutely not. You cannot. They can't do song. So we were, you know, it was, it was about an hour before the show, and I remembered that I had met the producer um, at a dinner like a couple of years earlier, and I, I had his. He had given me his card, and I had his number still, and I called the number, and he was driving in his convertible in Rome. He remembered me and he knew, understood, you know, I explained it to him and he said, give me five minutes. And then I, within, you know, half hour, I had a call from the publisher saying, of course you can use it. It was almost like the Don had called. Um, so we had it about half hour before the show. Wow. <laughs> Don't you love that when that happens? Crazy. It would have been um, her fault if it didn't, though. Yeah. I, I was just gonna say the expectation is is generally that we're able to pull off these miracles. <laughs> what about you, Angela? I know you've you've got something. It's a gospel show. Nothing. I have nothing for you. No, I'm just kidding. No, I mean <laughs> there was really a lot behind the scenes going on with the contestants more so than anything. Um, a lot of egos and <laughs> personalities, but. There was uh, one of the contestants who was one of our finalists and his dad is a famous gospel singer. And so he wanted to do a rendition of his father's song and the state controlled uh, the song because he's deceased now, his, both of his parents actually. So we had to get it for gratis because it's a competition show. We couldn't pay for it. You know, in the back end, they wanted money and we were getting ready to shoot it. And, you know, luckily we were able to work it out, but that was probably one of my biggest battles because he had to do the song and they wanted money and we couldn't give them money because it's a conflict of interest to pay for something like that. So that was kind of my, my battle. Wait, the parents were deceased and the estate they, would not allow his son to perform the song. Without getting money. Yeah. Okay. They didn't understand. But yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it was, it was some greed involved here, but you know, it worked out. So, <laughs> and it worked out for him because he won. So, hey. I, I remember that. Um, anything on your side? Well, I don't know if I mean all of those stories are every every show that I've I've been in is that last minute. You know, who can I call to try to change this person's mind or you know fix this scenario because this artist wants to perform it. They're gonna perform it. You know, I <laughs> I can't tell that person not to do that. Um, so. I guess that, um, I mean, I, I do the VMAs, so Kanye West is always my war story. Um, yeah. <laughs> many, many shows I've, I've called a farmer on a ranch somewhere because he had sampled something in a song. I've, you know, there's all of those. Um, I think my favorite though is when we did honor him for Vanguard 
it was literally hours before the show and we didn't know if he was performing, if he was just speaking, if he was going to do cartwheels. We had absolutely no idea what he was going to do literally up until he got on stage. So that was nerve wracking. <laughs> you never do with Kanye. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's what makes president. the show. Look what happened. He was almost president. <laughs> you voted for him, Kanye. Uh, <laughs> you voted for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, these days, uh, it, it seems like there's an award show or a competition show for everything. Uh, how do you guys make your show, shows memorable and distinct in such a crowded space? Um, I guess I, I can know, jump I in. That's okay. a, you know, yeah, go ahead, Rick. Uh, I mean, I just, just coming from the experience of doing one every year, I've done it since I was music soup since 2013 and been on the show since like 2008. And to me to do VMAs every year, the fun part is getting involved with the creative, the like look, the design. I think it's so cool that they could reinvent this same thing every year, stylistically different every time. So I think that's the cool thing. And I try to like learn that and get involved with that as early as I can, because then I'll tailor the music that way and you know if it's neon and electric this year then I'll try to make it sound like that through the whole show um and I think that's that's what makes these things cool it's they're it's the same thing but different every time right Jill you were going to say something no I was just to say I think all of these shows try to if the ones that are perpetual first of all Nobody never knows what kind of show is going to resonate with, with people. You can have a great show and people just don't love it. And it has one season and you can have one that all of a sudden people love and it just takes off. But I, I think on the shows that have life, they just always try to do something to modernize it or to change something up every season. Just to, It's the same show, but just with a little bit more, more interest. Like I know we always flip coaches around on the voice because they think that that makes it more interesting for people. I mean, just, I think that, I think so you have to keep it somewhat modern, something a little bit of a new punch. But yeah. well, there's nothing like Sunday's best. So it kind of is in its own lane as a gospel competition. And Jesse Collins did a great job with his team coming in and revamping the show because it's pretty much customary performance, you know, battle style. But he really came through with the concepts, like I said, Aretha Franklin, her gospel styles, and then the remix episode. So he brought a fresh face to it. I want to watch that show after watching the clip. It's, I know. <laughs> it's, it's online, BT. Check it out. And so my last question for you guys. Uh, this genre is extremely specific and it requires, I think, a unique skill set. What advice would you give to someone who wanted to get into this area? I would jump in on that one and say that... Um, because clearance is so important in, in, this, uh, in this genre, um, relationships are everything. So I would say to the, you know, you folks that are starting out, you know, to get out there and go to everything, join the guild, you know, get involved and, and just network. And, you know, everybody, you know, even everyone in, at, at the, whatever you're doing, you know, your, your friends are also going to be the ones who are running the publishing companies later or the head of, you know, whatever, you know, a, a clearance person somewhere. So, you know, get out, get these relationships. I mean, it's hard to do right now, obviously, but um, maybe virtually. Um, but just, you know, just really cultivate these relationships because it's it it. It's everything. And then also try to get as much lead time as you can on these shows and, and not overwhelm, you know, the publishers and the labels with our needs because um, it can drive them a little crazy. And what about on the uh, award show side? Rick? Um, I mean, yeah, lead time is, is all of our greatest gift. But um, I, yeah, relationships. I also try to keep track of songwriters and publishers we're dealing with a lot for VMAs. Usually it's the, a brand new song. So the publishing splits aren't figured out and things like that. But if I know it's these three writers and I, they're, you know, I know they're signed to Sony ATV. I know they're, you know, so we can at least get it approved, pending the splits information and things like that. But 
yeah, just uh, tracking who is who and whether that's songwriters or the publishers they're connected to is is key, I think. I've also being a good detective, I, I often think that half of the time I'm a, de a detective because I'm sc scrolling through somebody's Facebook looking for an email contact because they're a random writer on a song that they have 2.5%, you know, and, and I've found them <laughs> somewhere. But yeah, just being being good at um, tracking people down. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys for uh, enduring my questions. And I have some questions here coming in from the from the 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 audience. Um, we have one. Robin, what's the difference between life of show versus archival in perpetuity from Christina? Archival in perpetuity. Well, life of show, it's you're you're not licensing the song for the life of show. You know, let's say I clear it on season you know, one of ABC. And I, and I get a life of show approval. That means season two, I already have that song cleared. If I use it, then I send a request for a license. So it's not, I'm not licensing it up front. I'm just getting approval to use it. And then, you know, and, and I always, um, I spend, you know, two, three hours a week during the season telling everybody whose songs are going to be on the show, by the way, which is another thing that is time consuming, but Publishers and the labels really appreciate it. When I was a polygram, it was always frustrating for me when I would, would you know, work something, work on something, and never know if it made it in there until after the fact. So um, it's helpful for them, and they can also they can use their social media to help you. By the way, um, you know, to help your shows. So you know, if you tell the label the songs that are going to be in the background that week, they can start. They can you know put social media out and help them post it. You know, information is key. But um, anyway, you're just, you're proving that you're not licensing it up. And she has the second part to that. What if the copyright moves, does the approval go with it? Well, that's where at the end of every season, for the start of the next season, I will send every publisher and every label, here's what you've pre-approved for your life of show. Take your time, go through it. If you've lost copyrights, if anybody's changed their mind, take it off the list. And we make sure you know we don't have it on for the next season. So it's you know it's easy when they lose it. And you know it's every year something happens. Like we'll use something. And I'm sure this happens to everybody. You use something by the time between the time when it's approved for the show and by the time you get to license, they've lost a the copyright. And it's, it's not a big deal. 99.9% .9 of the time you go to the publisher and say, hey, this is good, clearance, there's a license request, and it's, it's done. So it's never really a problem. And we have some money questions here. Uh, uh, Daniel wants to know what's the MFN on something like that. You can't tell me. If you can't say, it's fine. I don't know. <laughs> It's not a lot. I'll say that they no very few people approve their repertoire for these shows for the money. Nice money, and it adds up. The publishers and the labels get, especially the publishers, get a huge check from us every year. So it's great money for them. But on an individual basis, it's not a lot of money. But they don't do it for that. They do it for the exposure, for the you know, degrading the copyright, you know, reminding. people the song, reinventing a song and getting people excited about it again. A lot of other reasons, like airplay. And there, there is on these on these performance shows, off these live prime time or whatever, that the performance income is pretty hefty. The ASCAP and BMI money, it's it's pretty it's probably, it's as much as the sync fees. It's really and then if it gets it airs overseas, it's, so they do make money from it. Okay. Awesome. So we have one here for Rick. How does the clearance process differ when you're clearing Disney songs for a Disney program on a Disney-owned ABC versus securing external approvals from outside publishers? I would say very, very, very different. <laughs> uh, uh, surprisingly, though, it was kind of the same process because they treat ABC independently, um, at least on the licensing side. I still request a song 
there was still a negotiation of rates for the sing along. We, you know, determined an MFN and, and ran with that. And there was no questions of, about that afterwards. Um, but, uh, it, yeah, it's still like I have an ABC contact that I go to with the information and then we request it from a Disney contact. Um, and we kind of work hand in hand to get, get it approved. There are a few that Dis Disney don't own as well. That, that is a specialty case that we have to go out to. And, um, the like licensing of it isn't really that hard. They're requesting and things, but they are very partial about how it's used. If we are changing any of the lyrics, if we're doing a medley of them, this is all stuff that like, that's stuff that we have to like thoroughly describe when we go through it. I'm guessing you got, you rarely got a denial though. Rarely got a denial, um, <laughs> happily, but uh, we've only done two so far at <laughs> three counting, counting Christmas or holiday special that's coming. But yeah, we haven't, we haven't gotten any denials yet, luckily. But it's also the heart of the show. The intention is not to, we're not just performing it to perform the song. It's, we try to, you know, give something in the, in those performances. So I think people know that and feel it. Okay. Well, I think that's it for questions. If there's anyone else, feel free to type it in the chat really quick and I'll ask it. Um, and if not, I'm going to throw to Joel, who wants to say a few closing comments, but thank you all for uh, coming out and, and doing this panel with me. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and Joel. Hi, Joel. Thank you, Connie. And thank you so much, Viacom, for sponsoring this. This was amazing. This was actually really, really educational for me. You know, I've done some reality and done some awards and stuff like that. But listening to the true masters really, really <laughs> makes me scared. So uh, this was super fascinating and, and just a great uh, a learning lesson about, you know, the people who are really on the, the front lines of music supervision. So I thank you guys all for participating in this. and everybody who shows up um, every week to learn from all of us and to share in the community. We're so happy to have you. Um, and I'm really happy this. And thanks to our education uh, um, committee who puts this together. Yvette and Lindsay are just monsters putting this all together. And uh, our sponsorship committee who helps help us, uh, you know, keep this guild afloat. So McHugh and his committee are just amazing. So uh, thanks to everyone. You know, again, this is an all volunteer uh, board and um, everybody is just putting in their time for this because they just love this community. And I'm so happy that you guys are still kind of in this separate worlds, still communicating and, and being involved with each other. Um, and I have a, a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is that um, our board elections for Guild of Music Supervisors open tomorrow. So we have four seats open. Uh, we have three returning board members who are up for it. And that's uh, Madonna, our vice president, Heather Bear, and um, who else? Ed Gerard, uh, who are up for re-election. And then we have several uh, candidates who are also applying to join the seat that is being vacated by Amanda Creek Thomas, who is uh, stepping down to do other things. So there is a chance for, for people to be more involved and we are, love having people engaged. So uh, look for the, uh, the information on the election and uh, tomorrow for every, for this is open to full members uh, to participate in this. Um, and other one, you may have seen the uh, announcement that went out and went out to the trades, but we've officially announced that our uh, uh, our 11th annual awards are gonna be April 11th this year. It's gonna be virtual. Um, and we're starting to put it together right now. And the big uh, lead announcement is that Quincy Jones is going to be our icon this year. And he has agreed to do this. He's not doing almost nothing else this year, except for uh, being involved with the music supervisors. And we are honoring him for being a storyteller in music. So uh, this is going to be a great, great event. So everybody stay tuned to that. Um, our education conference is coming up for the middle of February, and that's going to be pretty stellar as well. So um, uh, also our peers in Canada are having a conference that starts next week. So if you want to participate in that, um, I think we circulated emails about that. And, uh, you know, we're just keeping busy and keeping everybody engaged. So Please do be involved. You know, anytime somebody raises a hand with a question or a comment, we like to grab that hand and bring them along with us and uh, put them to work. So, you know, if you want to be involved, raise your hand and uh, 
Angela Sheik is right down there. She is our, our executive manager for the guild, and uh, she's the one who will put the hook in you, grab you, and work. So, uh, everybody, thank you so much. Thanks for being involved, and uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you next. Angela, is there anything I'm forgetting? I did good. I did good. Thank you, guys. I appreciate thank you. you. Thanks, Connie. Thanks, Anita. Bye, y'all. Bye. Hey, Robin. Miss you. Ah. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.